911 emergency, can I help you? Uh, yeah, I need an ambulance at my neighbor's house. What is your address, Cindy? Oh, I don't know. I was sleeping in the camper and I just woke up. <laughs> and there's blood all over my husband. On the morning of August 30th, 2006, a neighbor called 911 after Schultz Yedis arrived at their home saying that something was wrong with her husband, Ken. He's awake, talking, anything? No, he's just awake. I don't know what happened. My phone's won't work. Her phone's won't work, she says. <laughs> Seemingly in shock and confused, Schultz Yedis then went to another neighbor's house, and they too called 911. I'm calling for Mrs. Ken Edith. She's in the house here, and she said her husband is in their house all full of blood. What is the address where the ambulance is needed at? You know what your address is, honey? No, she's so shook up. So what exactly happened that led Cindy Schultz Edith to race to two of her neighbors' homes and have them call 911? On the evening of August 29th, we're to sleep in the duckling camper. I had headaches due to a sinus infection. And who suggested that, if anybody? Ken. He was sleeping in a small camper. She'd been having trouble sleeping. Ken was a pharmacist, gave her some medication. I got up and I went up the, the deck steps into the house. I went to the front door, opened it up, saw his vehicle. First, I thought maybe he overslept, but no, he would never do that. And then I thought he was home sick from work. So I went into the bedroom and I saw Ken. For 10 years, there's minimal movement in the investigation of Ken Yedis' murder. And Ken's grieving family anxiously wait. Hi, Detective McCarthy, it's Cindy Yedis. Um, I'm just checking to see if there's anything new on the case. Ken and I would have been married three years today. There was no new evidence that was discovered. While this case never closed, it sort of became cold. Certainly, Cindy remained on the map. I had frequent uh, communication with her. There were times when she would want us to come back to the house if she found something she thought was pertinent. Over the years, you had a lot of turnover in DAs who were looking over this case and deciding whether or not there was enough evidence to bring charges against Cindy schultz -Yedis. But then you go to 2016, and a new detective takes a look at the case. Detective Blazer testified previously as being involved in the investigation of the homicide of Ken Yedis. Yes. In October of 2019, Detective Blazer goes to Cindy schultz -Yedis home. I think it was five or six hour drilling by Blazer. These new conversations with Cindy have brought new life to the investigation. Lots of subpoenas, lots of banking and life insurance information. There was indeed large policies on Ken. It was over $1 million. This is Cindy Yedis calling, and my husband had a policy through your company. My husband was the victim of a homicide. During that time period, there were five separate changes to Ken's insurance. Upon Ken's death, the defendant was now the designated beneficiary of $973,000. And then you move on from there and the farm itself. She sold their the land, she sold their farm. This is a search warrant. We're arresting you for Ken's death. Can I go change my clothes, please? No, because they're going to be wearing orange tonight. She wanted to take the stand. She wanted to let everybody know that she was not the person that uh, killed her husband. Nine times out of 10, I will tell you, a defendant should not take the stand. They could say something they're not supposed to say. They could give the prosecution more ammunition, give something more for the jury to convict them. You're asked if you killed your husband, what did you respond to the police? No. And then we have one, two, three interviews on there, all in the year 2006. To your best memory, are those accurate? To my best memory. 
And then we go 10 years. You agreed to an interview of seven and a quarter hours on 10 24 19, correct? Yeah. Why did you agree to all these interviews? Because I didn't kill my husband. And I wanted to find out, I guess, who did. She kept a pretty uh, open dialogue and channels communication. But looking back, I think a lot of that was because she wanted to uh, direct the show, if you will. Nothing about the events on August 29th, 2006 were ordinary. Normally, the Yiddis home would have been locked up tight the night of Ken's murder. Every door in the Yiddis home was unlocked. Ken Yiddis was a pharmacist who never missed work and would not have gotten drunk the night before he had to go to work. The defendant was at the Yiddis home the night of Ken's murder, but she did not sleep in the same bed with Ken that night. The morning of August 30th of 2006, when you initially entered the bedroom, you saw your husband still, is that correct? From the bathroom, I saw like the top of his head and uh, I just saw stuff. When you opened the door to the bedroom from that bathroom, what did you see? I think you've asked me about this before, and I've answered it before. So ask and answered. Cindy became argumentative while testifying. That's never a good thing. She wasn't handling it real well. I thought she'd be all right on the stand. And she was, she was to a degree. You told law enforcement previously that you saw him breathing, correct? When I looked from the bathroom, then I thought I saw him breathing. Yes. You are trained in CPR as a result of having foster children. Yes. And you would agree that CPR is to be provided to individuals until medical personnel arrive. That is the purpose of CPR. And you do not administer any aid whatsoever, correct? I did not administer first aid, no. Cindy doesn't perform CPR on Ken. After she discovers Ken Yedis, her husband is dead. The phones in the house suddenly don't work. She can't use her cell phone. Awfully coincidental. The prosecution had another key piece of evidence that they argued didn't make sense. When we first arrived, we could see one of the cameras pointing right down from the garage onto the driveway. Incidentally, uh, the night of the homicide, the system was off. You shut off that surveillance system on August 24th of 2006, correct? I told Detective Blazer that at one point during the summer, there were 27 tornadoes that came through Wisconsin and Ken called me from work and told me to turn the surveillance system off. And you turned off the surveillance system and it was not turned back on before Ken's murder, correct? I was not aware of that. You thought the surveillance system might have been on? I wasn't aware of whether it was on or not that night. And you didn't tell anyone that day or the next day or the next day about the video surveillance system, did you? I don't recall. I understand that we have a verdict in State of Wisconsin versus Cindy Schultz, 19 CF 1366. We, the jury, as and for our verdict, find the defendant, Cindy Schultz, you just guilty of first degree intentional homicide. As to count two, State of Wisconsin versus Cindy Schultz, you just we, the jury, as in for our verdict, find the defendant, Cindy Schultz, guilty of obstructing an officer. I got up and left. I felt that she didn't have a fair trial. I really didn't believe she did it. Put all the evidence out, how in the hell would she do it? She's sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Does justice mean I get my brother back? No. Does justice mean that all the pain we suffered because of his death goes away? No. Cindy was in the process of appealing, but on July 16, 2023, after serving one year of her life sentence, she was killed in prison, allegedly by a fellow prisoner. I just thought, God, what a tragedy. We have many people put in prison that are innocent, and unfortunately, in my opinion, Cindy was one of them.